Good morning, everyone. Welcome to an edition of Athenaeum Spotlight with Guy McLean. That's Guy McLean. I'm Mark Auerbach. And we're here to chat about all things Westfield Athenaeum. And we have a guest on our second half of today's program. So, Guy, what's going on? Oh, well, it, uh, we're well into the summer season, into summer reading. Uh, we've got a great, we've got all these great programs that are going on right now. Uh, and it's, it's great to see the activity, all the kids coming in uh, for the summer reading program. And I think this is, this is one of our most important uh, programs of the year because summer reading uh, is actually a fairly new phenomenon in libraries. Uh, you know, only last maybe 20 years or so has summer reading been such a big deal. And the reason that's the case is because many um, edu- people in the education field were realizing that children were, their reading skills were declining over the summer, that the reading skills that they'd obtained by the end of the school year in the spring uh, would decline and that, st- and that teachers would have to kind of pick up uh, that, that loss in the next year. So uh, it, it, there was a real concern about that among uh, education leaders. Uh, and uh, what public libraries realized is we could step in, encourage summer reading programs, uh, set up uh, set up uh, all kinds of special events to, to you know, and rewards uh, to get the kids interested in participating in the programs. And so now it's become a really big deal. And it's one of our most active times of year. When you were a kid going to school, did you have a summer reading list? N- no. No, I mean they didn't give you know at, at that time at least in my schools uh, they they did not do that. And yeah, when I when I went to high school, we had a, a summer reading list of three books that we had to read over the course of the summer independently, and we'd be tested on them the first week we or have to write a paper on them the first week we got back to school. Yeah, yeah, they and were the most a, and boring. They were the most boring. Books yeah. ever. Yes, yes. Well, and 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 one of the, and that's one of the things that's changed quite a bit is you know if you assign specific books, maybe maybe the kids are not interested in that particular topic or whatever. The great thing about summer reading is we just encourage reading. Period. Come to the library, find a book that you're interested in, and, and read. And you know we we, we put kind of incentives. Uh, our goal is to get people to read a thousand hours. Uh, I mean uh, th- through the course. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, a thousand minutes through the course of the summer. And so it, it becomes a real, uh, you know, it's, there's a go- there are goals in mind. And because of the fact that kids are very, you know, can, can read whatever they're interested in, it really encourages them to actually invo- get involved in reading. And now we've expanded it to adults. Adults can participate in the summer reading program. And many times parents do that right along with their children just to, you know, just to encourage that kind of activity. So I know that you are a nonstop reader, that you always have at least three or four books that you're reading. Is there one book that you are reading this summer that you want to share? Yes, yes. What, the book I'm reading right now that I'm just fascinated with is a book called Beauty and Sadness. It's about the life of Gustav Mahler, and it's looking at his symphonies, looking at his life and his symphonies. He wrote 10 symphonies, actually nine symphonies. His 10th symphony he didn't finish, uh, but it's a fascinating read. Mahler's life was very uh, <coughs> uh, interesting. He had a very interesting career as a great conductor. He was a great pianist, but most importantly, he was a great composer. Also, to another element that was very, uh, we're very interested, uh, interesting about his life is his relationship with Alma Mahler. Uh, Alma Mahler uh, was a very, very interesting woman uh, in Vienna around the turn of the century. She was a composer herself, even though that's were one they of, related? Uh, uh, no, no, <coughs> no. She was the daughter. Uh, of of an artist in Vienna uh, at that time, a fairly well known artist. But she was she herself uh, was very interested in music. But the sad thing about that is, um, uh, Mahler felt Gustav uh, felt that uh, there couldn't be two composers in the family. So Alma kind of uh, put that uh, put her composing aside uh, there, which is kind of a sad story in itself. But th- but the story of their relationship and the experiences <coughs> they had. Uh, Mahler's health problems, those kind of difficulties, is a fascinating story. So I, I've really been uh, enjoying the, uh, that book. That's one of the most interesting uh, books I've come across in some time, and very well written. It's written by a person who is not a professional musician himself, uh, but just someone who has a deep, <coughs> deep interest 
uh, in the classical repertoire uh, and in, you know in composers of that era. So that's that that's been that's the book I've been most involved with lately. Do you think it has a happy ending? Um, that's you know uh, uh, I guess you might say all biographies in a way have have uh, tragic endings because uh, the person they, it's about they die, they die. Yeah. Uh, and and the sad thing about Mahler is he died at a very young age he was only around fifty years of age when he died because he had heart he had uh, heart issues uh, and, and, uh, and the very uh, famous thing about that there were uh, he suffered. In the year 1907, he suffered from three tragedies. Uh, he he uh, through through all kinds of political problems. He uh, was forced to resign from the 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 uh, as the conductor of the Vienna State Opera. The, at that time, it still is to this day really the greatest opera house in the world, uh, the pinnacle of of the opera you know in the opera world. So he he lost his conducting position at the Vienna State Opera. Of course, the United States was a beneficiary. That he because he came to New York and conducted both the Metropolitan Opera and the New York Philharmonic. Uh, after that, the second tragedy, he lost his uh, four-year-old daughter uh, uh, during the summer there in his summer at his summer home, and then. Uh, uh, the doctor who had who had been there treating uh, his daughter, and then uh, Alma, the mother who was distraught by the loss of her daughter, uh, uh, decided to give an examination to Gustav himself to see how he was doing physically, and discovered that he had a, a heart ailment that would uh, literally kill him in four years. Four years after that event, so 1907 was not a good year for Gustav Mahler. Definitely not. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the great. Tragedy tragedy of that, and it, and it influenced his last works, uh, his uh, uh, Das Lied von der, er uh, von der Erde, which is translated as the songs of the earth, uh, is very heart-wrenching, uh, and, and, you know, if you know the fact that he had, uh, uh, the previous year had discovered this, this illness that was going to uh, uh, lead to his early death, uh, you can you can just feel that in the music, uh, so it's it's a it, you know in that way it's a tragic story. But Mahler produced some of the most interesting music at that time. I don't think I you know I think that um, uh, even though Mahler is becoming much better known, uh, I, I don't think people realize just how significant he was as a composer. He really uh, expanded uh, uh, the symphonic form, took the symphonies of. Mozart and Haydn, Beethoven, Brahms, and really expanded them and used them in ways that those composers had not even thought yeah, about. Yeah, he's not performed very often around here because it involves a full orchestra, not just a regular orchestra, but a really big one. And some of his pieces are 80, 90 minutes in length, too, because, so uh, it's hard to put together uh, performances of Mahler's music, but uh, you know, I, I, I would say anyone who is interested in classical music, if you have opportunities to hear Mahler symphonies, especially uh, Mahler played by the Boston Symphony or one of the great orchestras, uh, don't miss that opportunity because it's just an incredible experience uh, to hear in a live performance the music of Mahler. So now that we're in the in the heart of summer and there's a reading program at the Athenaeum, uh, what are you doing this summer? Vacation, opera going, beach. What, what's on your agenda? Well, well, I always uh, uh, one of the things, and this will fit not real nicely with the second half of the program. I always love to go to Tanglewood, and I've already I've already been marking my schedule. I always get the little pamphlet that Tanglewood puts out with all the concerts, and I always check off the ones I want to go to. And I've got about a dozen uh, concerts uh, uh, checked off to go to. So I'm going to be on the Mass Pike a lot this summer, going to Tanglewood. Uh, so I, I hope to do that quite a bit. I always love to do that in July and early August. I also uh, am thinking about going down to Santa Fe to the music festival uh, in Santa Fe. Uh, I've never been to that, even though I, li as a child, I lived in New Mexico. I never uh, attended the Santa Fe f uh, music festival. The Santa Fe time. Opera is one of the most incredible facilities ever, not necessarily because their operas are great, but it's a theater that's built with an open air to it, and you're actually sort of sitting outside. Yes. It never rains in Santa Fe. Yeah, yeah, right. You know? And um, there, it, the city is just known for its culture. 
Yes, yes. Well, that's another reason I, I want to go to Santa Fe is not only for the music festival, but there's a, a great art scene there. Many, you know, a great art galleries, a real active art scene. And so I thought that'd be a great thing to do this summer is to get down to do that, uh, to supplement uh, uh, Tanglewood. When I worked for public radio, they ran a tour to, the San, to Santa Fe every year, to the opera and... Uh, a series of museums. I mean, one of them, I think, was the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Taos. In Taos, yeah. Yeah, and a couple of others. But it was a four-day trip, and there was chamber music, but they would go to, like, two or three operas. And people would come back. Not only did they think that just the experience of going to that opera house was great, but the food. They talked about the food in Santa Fe. It's being so phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, that's going to be an interesting trip. I'm really f- looking forward to that because, you know, just, there's just a lot of great things. And then there's some great uh, historic sites of the things. The, there's the uh, cliff dwellings, the Native American cliff dwellings that are close to Santa Fe that are very interesting. Taos, you know, you mentioned Taos, where the O'Keeffe Museum is, where she lived. Uh, is very interesting. I actually have been there to the Taos, uh, to her to her home in Taos. Uh, so that's another beautiful place to go to. So I'm really looking forward to that. But then also, too, in addition to Tanglewood and Santa Fe, I also want to get to Glimmerglass and see uh, uh, see some of the operas. Glimmerglass is another beautiful place. It's right on the lake there. Uh, uh, you know, and, and that's a beautiful, you know, Coop, it's right outside of Cooperstown, New York. And there's, you know, there's a nice art museum there and but and there's I, that baseball hall of fame the baseball hall of the, fame yeah for the for the, the sports jocks, people you know. yeah yeah you know uh you know do opera you know uh, at night and go to the baseball hall of fame you know when you that. think about it there's so much going on right now in our area you could do a different thing every night and not be able to do half of what's being out there. Absolutely, absolutely, because you know there's so many music festivals around and this sort of thing. Um, another thing that I want to do is get up to Mass Mocha uh, for the Bang on a Can Music Festival. Uh, Bang on a Can is a is a is a group of composers. They organized as a kind of a consortium, you might say, of composers back in the 1980s, uh, and and. Now, two of the composers that were the founders of Bang & Can have actually won Pulitzer Prizes for their music compositions, and so they've really become very well known uh, now, but they continue to do these interesting programs, and e- every summer uh, they have a residency program at Mass Mocha. Uh, and they play little little concerts, little mini uh, concerts in in the gallery, the various galleries. And then at the end of the one month residency, they do what they call, uh, and these are very famous in the music world, a bang on a can marathon. And I really encourage anybody who hasn't done a, ma- a bang on a can marathon to go experience it. Uh, they always do it on a Saturday. And it starts at four o'clock. Uh, they start the music right there in the you know. The, there's a really nice auditorium at Mass Mocha. They start performing and they perform uh, literally. They usually do 14, 15, 16 composers. Uh, are a piece is performed by uh, uh, all these different composers through the evening. It goes from four usually till 10:30, 11 o'clock at night. And of course, of course, you don't you know. And people go like, "Wow, that's a long time to listen to music." But you don't have to stay. Uh, people come in and out. People go out. You know, they always have a barbecue thing set up there, and you can go into the art galleries and look at art for a while, and then walk back in and pick up where you left off. So you don't have to do all four or five hours of it. You just you you pick and choose what you want to want to attend. But it's always a lot of fun, and it's a great way to hear what's going on in the contemporary music world. You hear all these composers who are doing amazing music right now, including. Uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning composers that usually are in attendance uh, there at the event. So, th- so there's an, an incredible amount that you can do right around here, especially when it comes to music. What about theater and dance? Do you do any? Th- are you a theater or dance person, or are you primarily music? I do. I do less of that. Jacob's Pillow, of course, is wonderful. Uh, I do less of that because because I, I spend so much time going to the concerts and operas. I just you know I, I can only get so much in, uh, and so I tend to yeah, I tend to go that direction and don't do theater and dance as much. But you know I do 
like when when the opportunity presents itself. I always do enjoy going to, uh, you know, a good theater production. You know, local theaters can sometimes put on excellent productions. Many times, of plays that are experimental or are really kind of uh, you know get into different yeah, areas. The cool thing about our theater scene is. There are a lot of mainstream shows, like you could go to Berkshire Theatre Group and see Million Dollar Quartet or Barrington Stage and see Cabaret. But for every Cabaret or Million Dollar Quartet, there's something off the wall and different. Yeah, and that's what I like. I like to seek out those things that are quite... I do the same thing with music, too. It's one of the reasons I like the Bang on a Can Music Festival is uh, you hear composers that are doing really interesting, different things, and that's really exciting to me. They're, they're, they're kind of... Uh, that group kind of breaks away from the mainstream, what we would call mainstream classical music, and I think the same, I think the same thing applies in theater. Uh, it's really fun to see something that's a little different, a little edgy, it has a new kind of perspective an angle on uh, putting on on, a, on doing theater. Uh, so yeah, I, I really look for those opportunities, and it's amazing. Summer summer music festivals, summer theater festivals, things like that. That's where you're going to find uh, the most interesting new ideas in music, theater, what you know, dance, all those areas. You've lived and worked all over the country, right? And That's, so yes, I mean, Western Massachusetts is only one part of your career and personal life. What keeps you here? What, what, I mean, there's so much going on. What, is there one cultural institution or two that keep you here and you go, I got to go every year? Well, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, the Boston Symphony is very accessible in the summer at Tanglewood, and I go in during the, during the winter. I, you know, get on the Mass Pike, go the other direction, go into Boston to go to concerts. Uh, the Boston Symphony is one of the greatest orchestras in the world. Uh, we're very fortunate to have this literally an hour and a half away from us by, by, by car. Uh, and, and so I take advantage of the Boston Symphony quite a bit. Then the other direction, uh, the fact that in Western Mass, we can go, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to get down to New York City. And in New York has, you know, the Metropolitan Opera, uh, some of the greatest opera uh, singers in the world are there. And then and there's th Broadway. And then there's, and then there's Broadway. Uh, and it's interesting that the Metropolitan is starting to incorporate more, uh, you know, Broadway, you know, modern productions that have a very close affinity to Broadway, like Terrence Blanchard's Champion that was just, that was just uh, performed by the, by, the, by the Met. It really has a Broadway feel in many ways to it. And, and Terrence Blanchard comes out of a jazz tradition, so it has that, that link too. That's a very new thing for the Met, um, and I, probably a very good move on their part. I think so. I, most of their productions, I believe, in the next year are at least a third are new. Yeah. Which is, it, you know, you can see Aida again and again, or La Traviata or Carmen, which is great because people that are getting into opera need to have the opportunity to see the classics. But you want to see things that you can't see or, or flip on a recording of. And so this new stuff that they're doing is, is great. Well, and, and that was my experience. I think you're absolutely right about that. That was my experience when I went uh, to the Met uh, in April. I did a weekend in New York. Uh, Saturday night, I did Terrence Blanchard's Champion. The place was packed and alive with energy and activity. Uh, and, and the next afternoon, Sunday afternoon, I went to Puccini's La Boheme, a great classic opera. I love it. Uh, the, the, the performance was excellent. But uh, I would say probably at least a third of the seats were empty. Uh, and, and I think the reason for that is... Uh, especially to New Yorkers who go to the opera a lot, they've, they've seen multiple productions of La Boheme, and so it's like it's not a big deal. And so I think that's, I think you're absolutely right. Well, that's part of it. The other part of it is the Met is so expensive to go. And, well, that's right. you got to pick and choose, you know, and, and, I, and so I think that, that the fact that the, the Met is moving toward newer productions. Yeah. When, when I started going to the theater and I lived in New York in the 80s, there were people that would subscribe to the Met and go every week. Yeah. You know, and you think, where can you get the money to be able to afford to do it? But there was that strata of New York uh, theater goers that had the money 
that could go every week, and they wanted to see the war horses. Right. They, you know, right. They right. wanted to see Bohem year in and year out, and they didn't want the new stuff. And now it's the new stuff that people want to go see. Well, well, I think the problem here too is I think you're absolutely right. Subscribers thirty or forty years ago would go to fifteen or twenty operas a year. Now, active. People who love opera usually <coughs> usually go to maybe five or six productions a year. Uh, that's a that's a that's a change. I think also too there was a different dynamic at that time. There were two opera companies in New York right next to each other. You could do the New York City Opera or you could do the yeah. Met. I used to go to City Opera um, more than the Met. I did uh, too. I did because too because I had come from Wolf Trap and Houston Grand Opera and Beverly Sills was running City Opera, and City Opera was the opera for the people. Yes. And it wasn't overly priced. And you might not see famous stars, but you see really good productions. And they were adventurous in some of the stuff yeah. they did. But the Met was stodgy and old. and Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that was a thing that was, that was my experience as well. I, I preferred City Opera to the Met because the Met was just doing these very traditional productions. A lot of Zeffirelli, as beautiful as the Zeffirelli uh, theater sets were, uh, it was kind of, you know, very traditional. You go over to the New York City Opera, you heard new operas, you heard experimental productions. Uh, it, it was really exciting. Some of the most interesting opera performances I've ever experienced were at the New York City Opera, not at the Met. And I think now the Met's realizing that there's a real uh, gap uh, there, there's not this kind of experimental feel in, uh, in, in opera in New York now and that they needed to bring that in because there was a re there's a real demand for that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a new production of a new opera uh, about maybe a controversial theme or something. That's newsworthy. That's going to get into the newspapers. People are going to be reading about that. They're going to go like, I've got to go see that production. You can't do that with La Boheme, <coughs> uh, you know, or La Traviata or something. It's just too, you know, everybody knows it already. And so I think that's going to be a real gain for, for the, the Metropolitan Opera. And, and I think they, they have to realize the world is changing in that you don't have that traditional yeah. opera crowd. We should probably put a plug in for Berkshire Opera here yes. in Western Mass because they do at least one – contemporary production a year although the, i can't remember what their contemporary one is this year yeah but i, I um they've done we saw one together yeah and, that's you right know, you know and i i think i mean to me it wasn't really opera it was musical theater or yeah. just of a different genre right but it's around and about and, and that's one thing great about glimmer glass uh glimmer glass usually does a a broadway musical as well as, uh, you know, a contemporary opera and then a traditional opera or two uh, each year. They usually do four different operas, and they usually have that variety there, which is, gr which is really great. And, you know, and I think that's really the direction that opera houses should go. Broadway musicals are really, uh, many Broadway uh, 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 musicals are really very sophisticated productions that are comparable to opera. I don't think people realize that, that opera is 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 very very similar in many, it many is. ways. It is. I think the thing that makes it different is that a lot of times they're sung in their original language, which is not English uh, always, and they're, they're different. But on Broadway right now, you have Sweeney Todd in a Correct. revival that has gotten incredible notices. It Sweeney Todd works in the Opera House. It works on Broadway. Um, it's with Josh Groban. And another musical, which would be very welcome in the Opera House that won the revival, uh, is Parade by yeah. uh, Jason Robert Brown. And it's a story of Leo Frank, who's a, a Jewish uh, factory manager in Atlanta in the early 1900s and anti Semitism. Uh, he's falsely convicted of a crime. Uh, and anti-Semitism, which is certainly a, a, a hot topic today. Yes. And uh, but parade would be just as com it would be just as fine in an opera house as it is on a Broadway it, stage. It certainly would. And people need to realize that things that we call opera today, when they were originally produced, weren't con 
classified as opera. For instance, Mozart's The Magic Flute has spoken text just like a musical. It really was what the, what the Germans in the 18th century called a singspiel, a song play, which is basically a musical, a play with singing in it. Uh, Carmen uh, also was originally written uh, with with uh, you know spoken dialogue. So th- so things that are in the opera houses today were really were musicals uh, in their in their original uh, uh, manifestation. So uh, people kind of think people tend to think of Broadway as some sort of lower form. It's not that case at all. Yeah. You know, West Side Story. We've got, we got to go to break here, sure. and we've got a guest coming. But before we do, um, are there still tickets left for people to go to Tanglewood? There's a grand total of two tickets left. Okay. So if, if you want to go, uh, call us very, very quickly. Okay, it's an all Gershwin program all Gershwin. on July 14th? July 14th. Uh, get, you get your bus from Westfield Athenaeum. A you, nice dinner. I, I was going to say a great dinner in yeah. Lee. Yes. Uh, shed tickets, and uh, you get to hear Guy chat about George Gershwin somewhere between the Westfield and Lee exits. Uh, I think you start talking in Blandford, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thereabouts. Thereabouts. Yes. Yeah. So westath.org is the details for that. We're going to take a break to acknowledge our underwriters, and we'll be back with more Athenaeum Spotlight. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. I'm Mark Auerbach back with Guy McLean. We'll return in just a moment. Support for Community Radio on WSKB is provided by Betts Plumbing and Heating Supply Company, an independent, family-owned wholesaler serving Westfield for over 50 years, specializing in plumbing, heating, and industrial piping supplies. On the web at BettsPlumbing.com or at 14 Coleman Avenue, in Westfield. Underwriting support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Greater Westfield Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business for the Greater Westfield communities. Informing, educating, advocating, the Chamber provides opportunities for members to make meaningful connections on local, regional, and state levels. For more information on the Chamber's many events, workshops, and programs, as well as the benefits of membership, visit westfieldbiz.org. The Chamber focuses on the most important economy, Yours. I'm Mark Auerbach. Join me every Friday at 8 a.m. for Arts Beat, where you'll meet interesting actors, directors, designers, and musicians here in Western New England. Community Radio 89.5 WSKB. Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 and 89.5 FM WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to Athenaeum Spotlight, everyone. I'm Mark Auerbach with Guy McLean. And in this half hour, we're going to Tanglewood up in the Berkshires. Now, I, I would assume that most people in the area, Guy, know about Tanglewood. Or they've, they've been probably for a Pops concert. Uh, things like James Taylor every year or the Boston Pops. But Tanglewood is one of the major arts organizations in Western New England. It is the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and it has so much going on every year from this period of time right now through Labor Day, not only in Azawa Hall and on the grounds, but there are other programs. And Anthony Fogg from Tanglewood is here with us this morning to talk about Tanglewood. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Great pleasure to be here. Um, I think, you know, for people that know a little bit about Tanglewood, but not a lot, what are what are the highlights of this coming season that would that you would encourage people to come out to Tanglewood for? Well, look, that's a tricky question for someone I mean, I, who spent I, the last couple of years planning the, the season to, to choose uh, one presentation over over the other. You know, we do have a, it's a very sort of rich um, selection of performances this season, and you've summed it up pretty well. Um, you know, we have some great musicians, performers from the field of popular artists. We, of course, have the Great Boston Symphony in residence for a total of seven weeks this season. Uh, the Boston Pops here for five concerts, um, alongside the remarkable talents of all of the young musicians in the Tanglewood Music Center, um, a wonderful recital series in Ozawa Hall, and then uh, the offerings of the Tanglewood Learning Institute, which is our, our new entity, which uh, 
was launched in 2019. So across the board, it's it's a really terrific season with something we think for everyone. Um, we we begin tomorrow night with one of my favourite events, which is the the taping of the NPR uh, news quiz. Wait, wait, don't tell me. Um, the NPR team comes here every other year and uh, does a taping. Um, it uh, it sprawls out over uh, close to two hours, and then by the magic of editing, by the following weekend, it's come down to a a very tight one hour show. So it's always wonderful to see um, what the original was, uh, knowing what was then left on the cutting room floor. And uh, it's a it's a it's a great team of of, um, of participants in the, in that program. So we begin tomorrow night with with that. Um, then we continue on on Friday with the Steve Miller Band, the first of our popular artist series uh, performers. Um, and it's a very, very strong lineup this year. Um, um, Steve Miller on Friday, then the following weekend, Elvis Costello, then a great night with Alison Krauss and Robert Plant, uh, James Taylor, of course, on July 3rd and 4th. And then we jump to the end of the summer where we have a, the very popular group Train coming back um, on the 24th of August. And then over Labor Day weekend, Jackson Brown, Gusta, and um, New News. Uh, we've just announced that we've added John Legend to the schedule on Sunday, the 3rd of September. So just looking at the Popular Artists series itself, um, there's a, a great variety and, and uh, you know, I'm among the biggest names in, in the field. Um, as always, the concerts by our music director, uh, Andres Nelsons, are invariably among the high points in the summer. Uh, Andres is back for a total of uh, four weeks of programs with both uh, the Boston Symphony and the Tanglewood Music Center Orchestra. He opens on the 7th of July uh, with the great pianist uh, Daniel Trifonov, who'd be performing at Prokofiev. Then in the course of the summer, he does um, Orff's Carmina Burana, a wonderful concert performance of Mozart's opera, Cosi Fan Tutte. Um, and then towards the end of the summer, we're doing some programs which we then take on the road. Um, the Boston Symphony is traveling to the major European festivals, summer festivals, uh, at the end of August and into September. And so it'll be a chance to have a preview of, of some of the, the, the great works that we'll be presenting on the major stages uh, around Europe. Um, so some of that uh, includes um, Prokofiev's Fifth Symphony, a couple of concertos with Jean-Yves Thibaudet. So Andres's programs are always um, wonderful events and um, not to be missed by, by, any, by any means. But some great guest conductors um, we have back with us, um, including our own Tom Wilkins, who's a very close associate with the, the orchestra, Susanna Melke, a wonderful Finnish conductor. Um, uh, Anna Rakitina, um, our, one of our fantastic young assistants. So a very rich lineup. And, you know, Tanglewood is lucky that we, we work with some of the greatest um, artists of our time. So regular appearances by um, Yo-Yo Ma, Emmanuel Axe, Joshua Bell, um, Leonidas Kavakos, Jean-Yves Thibaudet, um, you know, these are things that really stand out in the calendar for each each summer. And we're lucky that we have ongoing and wonderful relationships with some of these great, great artists. So um, their appearances will be dotted um, throughout the season. I'd, I'd like to mention, though, uh, even though I, I did a disclaimer and said I couldn't choose one event or one set of events over another, we do have several works that are uh, sort of from a theatrical uh, uh, genre. Um, over the opening weekend of the Tanglewood season, um, this will be on Saturday the 8th of July, the Boston Pops is reprising a production that they mounted uh, for the opening of the Spring Pop season in Boston last month. And it's a, a production of the wonderful musical Ragtime, uh, the work of Stephen Flaherty, the composer, um, Terence McNeil, the writer. Um, and it's a, it's an incredible piece um, and so important for our time. It, it deals with matters of immigration, of uh, 
race relations, of um, societal shifts. Um, these are very much, even though the piece itself is about 25 years old now, I believe, um, these are issues which are so important for all of us today. And um, to see this brought to the stage uh, with glorious music and um, the, you know, the wonderful Boston Pops and a fantastic cast is something else. So uh, on the opening weekend, I, I really would recommend that very strongly. We're also having um, a dance performance in the shed and we're welcoming a very talented uh, dance company from New Jersey called Nimbus Dance. And they're going to be doing a production, a choreography of Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring. Uh, and Copeland, of course, is a composer with um, with deep connections to Tanglewood. He came as the first head of the uh, then Berkshire Music Centre uh, in 1940 and was a constant presence um, throughout the following decades until his passing. And Copeland's music somehow resonates in a special way here. So um, this production that we're presenting with Nimbus Dance um, of Appalachian Spring, I think will be a very, very special occasion. And the other theatrical event that I wanted to mention is um, a repeat of a work that we premiered um, back in Boston in March, and it's a piece by Julia Wolf, one of uh, our most important composers, uh, called Her Story. And again, somewhat like uh, Ragtime, it's a, a work of incredible a contemporary importance and resonance. It was originally conceived to mark the passing of the 19th Amendment uh, to give voting rights to women, um, but uh, the conception of the piece later expanded, and it's 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 a more it's a broader view of um, the emerging importance and independence of women in society um, from from the 19th century onwards and. Uh, uh, a marvelous piece. It's performed by a very talented group called the Lorelei Ensemble. And it's a, again, it's a staged theatrical work that we'll be presenting here in the shed at Tanglewood and uh, a, a really very important, uh, a very important piece and, and one that garnered a great deal of critical acclaim when we gave those premiere performances several months ago. So I, I wanted to mention those three theatrical events um, in particular. And similarly, of course, one of the most popular evenings on any Tanglewood schedule is John Williams Film Night, which uh, this year will be on Saturday, the 5th of August. And uh, John, who celebrated his 91st birthday this year, uh, will be with us. Um, he's sharing the podium with David Newman, um, but uh, there'll be an evening full of uh, cinematic magic. Um, John includes several montages, clips of various movies and syncs the music to it. And it's incredible to watch it happen and uh, always draws a, a tremendous crowd. And you know, John has become such a, a beloved figure um, in our world. And it's, uh, it's wonderful to have him back here as a great friend of, of Tanglewood each, each summer. So that's, that's one of the other highlights, I think, uh, at, um, of the, the weekend lineup uh, in, in the shed. At the very end of the summer, uh, the Boston Pops uh, is presenting two uh, John Williams-focused evenings. They'll be doing a performance um, of the score with the film of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful score that John wrote for one of the early Harry Potter movies and just the virtuosity of the orchestra playing to this score in absolute sync is really something that takes a breath away. And then on Sunday, the 27th of August, uh, the Pops is doing uh, what we're calling Star Wars, the story in music, which um, tries the impossible, which is to um, capture the story from all nine episodes of Star Wars into one concert uh, with narration. Um, and uh, and you'll hear music from each of the movies uh, played by the Boston Pops and Keith Lockhart. So that's going to be a great way for us to finish our, our main series in, in August. Um, throughout the, the weekdays, of course, we have um, the great 
uh, advantage of, of a wonderful, one of the world's great uh, recital venues, and that is Seiji Ozawa Hall, um, which opened in 1994. And we have a, a wonderful series of programs uh, on the weeknights there starting next week with the final Tanglewood appearance by the Emerson String Quartet, uh, one of America's greatest quartets, and they'll be joined by Emmanuel Axe. And then the following night, uh, a very exciting uh, chamber orchestra from New York. Uh, they're, they're regulars here at Tanglewood called The Knights, and they're appearing with Chris Thiele, who's uh, well known as a, a mandolinist and vocalist, and he's also a very talented composer, and will be giving the world premiere of a, a song cycle that Chris has written for performance by himself with The Knights. And then right throughout the summer, there's some, some great things. Um, the Danish String Quartet in August, um, a wonderful program with the cellist Alisa Weilerstein, um, which brings together the cello suites <laughs> of Bach with some contemporary works. Um, we have a concert by uh, the great Broadway star, Kelly O'Hara, mm -hmm. on the 22nd of August. So again, a very, very sort of diverse uh, lineup for the Ozawa Hall series. Um, that's something for, for, you know, lovers of all musical genres as well. Alongside all of these great performances uh, will be the uh, two things, the, the concerts by the uh, Tanglewood Music Centre, and they have orchestra concerts on most Monday evenings, uh, chamber music every Sunday morning in Ozawa Hall, and then some other uh, isolated performances spotted throughout the week. Uh, and then, of course, there is um, the, the wonderful, wonderful work uh, at the Tanglewood Learning Institute. Um, this is a chance to sort of um, have an in-depth understanding of a lot of the music that's being performed at Tanglewood over the course of the summer. And there are various types of programming. On Thursdays, we have an In Conversation series where uh, one or two of the featured artists who are, are with us for that week's concert um, come and um, we have a chance to, through conversation, learn about their work, their artistry, their aspirations, their view on uh, the music business, etc. cetera. Um, we have a couple of what we call immersion weekends where we have an in-depth uh, look at some of the repertoire being performed that weekend. And the first of these is in fact over the opening weekend of the season and will be an in-depth look at this great work, uh, Ragtime, and there'll be lectures and uh, special presentations about the piece, um, about related themes. And then in um, in August, we have a very powerful immersion weekend, uh, which is looking at those composers who uh, perished during the Holocaust. Mm. Um, there was one in one particular, in particular one, one of the concentration camps in Terezin was one where artists and musicians and performers were all um, destined to their, their fate and um, their creative spirit uh, nonetheless was active right till the very last. And this is a chance um, to look with um, the curator of the weekend, Mark Ludwig, at the creative output of, um, of, that, of that place and during that period. It's a very powerful story and, and Mark has been a champion of this music for uh, a long time. Um, we also have some um, some great uh, speakers. Um, Isabel Wilkerson, the, the author, will be here to talk about her new book called Cast. And um, we have a, a wonderful collaboration between Yo-Yo uh, Ma, the cellist, and um, a visual artist, and that's on the 19th of August. So a great range of things in the Tangwood Music Centre, and it's it's a chance to really get under the, the surface of, of some of the music that's being performed here, get to know the artists um, who are creating the works and um, and uh, get a greater in-depth. So I think that's a pretty much a, a broad overview of everything that's happening. It's, it's hard to mention everything. It's hard to choose highlights because there are just so many, but as I, as I mentioned at the outset, a very rich and broad palette of offerings that we have uh, for everyone this year. And people can find out more about the season and order tickets at Tanglewood's very extensive website, which is tanglewood.org. And uh, you can go and not only find out 
who's performing, but the repertoire that they're doing. And if you seek it out, bios of the artists and all that. We're going to take a quick break to acknowledge our underwriters, and we'll be back more to chat about Tanglewood's 2023 season. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. I'm Mark Auerbach with Guy McLean, and we'll be right back. Underwriting support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Greater Westfield Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business for the Greater Westfield communities. Informing, educating, advocating, the Chamber provides opportunities for members to make meaningful connections on local, regional, and state levels. For more information on the Chamber's many events, workshops, and programs, as well as the benefits of membership, visit westfieldbiz.org. The Chamber focuses on the most important economy, yours. Hi, it's Bob Plass, and I have Wow! It's Tuesday, every Tuesday, 6 to 8. Wow! It's Tuesday. Community Radio. 89.5 WSC. I did it! <laughs> Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM, WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to Athenaeum Spotlight, everyone. If you've missed a part of today's program or you want to watch it again or share it with your friends, we're archiving it for you at WSKB Community Radio. We're chatting with Tony Fogg from Tanglewood and with Guy McLean, and I'm Mark Auerbach. And Guy, you had a question. Yes, yes. Uh, I was very interested when you were uh, talking about the theater series, the th theater productions. You mentioned Julia Wolf. Uh, there. Uh, she's a very interesting composer. In the first half of the program, before you came on, we were talking about uh, Bang on a Can, uh, the group of composers uh, that organized back in the 1980s and have become very significant now. And Julia Wolf, of course, is one of those founding members. And I'm, you know, uh, I think she's a very uh, interesting, uh, you know, I would say to our audience, uh, uh, one of the most interesting composers working today. So I'm, I'm really excited, looking forward to that production. But also, too, that reminded me that uh, Tanglewood uh, also has one of the most interesting contemporary music festivals um, uh, in, in the United States, where many of the great composers of the world uh, come in. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I always look forward to going to the contemporary music festival. Yes, look, thank you very much for asking. And I, I in my, in my, Summary: I, um, I I should have spent a little bit more time talking about the FCM. Uh, the Julia Wolf performance is part of the the FCM lineup. Uh, so um, this year, um, you know, the, the Festival of Contemporary Music has a long and very distinguished history. Um, uh, contemporary music has always had a, a, a central place here at Tanglewood. Um, I mentioned Aaron Copeland as the first head of the Berkshire Music Centre. Um, among the, the first head of the composition department was Paul Hindemith. Um, and it, over the years, it's been like a who's who of great composers of the 20th and 21st century who've been here working at Tanglewood. And uh, a good number of them have been the artistic directors of the Festival of Contemporary Music, which began uh, back in the 1960s with Gunther Schuller. Um, this year, uh, it's at the very end of July. Uh, we, we kick off on the 27th of July and, and then go through the 31st. And it's a, it's a really, it's a chance to um, have a, a, a great immersion in several, the works of several composers. Um, the, this year, the decision was made to uh, focus on the work of women composers. And we invited uh, four uh, very prominent and very talented women to curate the programs. Um, this includes Gabriella Lina Frank, uh, Anna Thorvalds Dottir, um, who is a leading uh, Icelandic composer, uh, Rina Esmail, um, who is from the West Coast. And uh, they have put together um, a really fascinating set of programs. Um, which includes some of their own music, but also the composers who've been important influences on them. Uh, Gabby Frank, for instance, uh, of course, is Peruvian by heritage and brings a lot of the sound of her country of origin um, to her scores and both chamber music and orchestra works. Uh, Anna Thorvalds Dottir brings something of the, the stark landscape of Iceland 
to many of her works. So um, this juxtaposition will be really fascinating and the performances are always uh, of exceptional uh, quality, um, whether they be chamber music, um, vocal music, or the big orchestra concert on Monday the 31st of, 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 of July that, that, that concludes the Festival of Contemporary Music. One of the, the fun uh, events that, that's taking place is um, a silent movie presentation with a new score uh, composed by the Tanglewood uh, composers who are here to study this year. And I, I'm not quite sure what what score has been selected for this summer. Last year, it was a, a Charlie Chaplin um, film that um, was scored by uh, four of the composer fellows and performed with a live small ensemble. Um, but it's always great to see this project um, take place and uh, the different approaches that the young composers uh, take to writing for film. Um, um, not quite often, not quite the sound world of John Williams, but um, equally as engaging. So um, a wonderful, wonderful um, five days of exploration. It's always a gathering uh, of Tanglewood of those who are passionate about new music um, many composers, publishers, people from the music business all assemble here for this great event. So um, uh, thank you for asking about it. And I, I commend it um, enthusiastically to, to anyone who's got open ears and an open mind uh, for, for new sounds and new ideas. Tony, how many of the performances do you personally get to go to? I pretty much go to everything. Um, when one spends uh, so much time uh, planning and preparing a curiosity as much as anything um, uh, forces one to be there to see how it all works out. But I love uh, many different styles of music and, um, you know, the whole atmosphere of hearing great work in this incredible uh, location. Um, it's just it, one, you hear things differently. I, I don't know how to describe it. But um, so, look, it's a pretty busy schedule. Um, I have to try and factor in a couple of free nights um, for my own personal sanity each week and try and be as disciplined as I can. But I, I'm basically here for everything, and it's, it's great to oversee it. Um, you know, we have a fantastic team that runs Tanglewood. I, I got out here over the weekend and just walking around the campus and seeing the utter beauty of it and um, the care and dedication with which all of the buildings are maintained, the, the gardens and the plant, planters and it, it, everything is done with such dedication. And I think that is, I think if anything, it's a symbol of our belief in the power and the importance of great music and how it can be a civilizing force in our society today and coming together onto the Tanglewood grounds is, is I think one of the great rituals and not only of the summer but of all time and uh, we, we, we should cherish that and support it um, to our best. Do you, uh, do you visit Tanglewood off season at all? Well yes I do. Um, I, I have a house in Stockbridge um, so I come out from Boston whenever I can and um, even in the snowiest of conditions, I love to walk around the grounds and uh, just feel the energy that's here, even in those times. It's uh, particularly during the fall season. It's, of course, incredibly beautiful. And uh, and uh, one can be transported in, in, in a different way, even though there's not the great sounds of the Boston Symphony or the Boston Pops or our wonderful young students somehow the spirit of all of that and the energy remains here, even in in those uh, non summer months. Yeah, I, I, I wish I wish Tanglewood uh, would continue into the fall. You know, I hate to see it always come to an end at the end of the summer. Yes. Well, you can well, walk you can walk on the grounds year round. Am I correct? Is that is that yeah? That's correct. Yes, yes. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, uh, our wonderful new facility, the Lindy Center for Music and Learning, is an all an all seasons uh, facility, and so. Um, we do have presentations um, there throughout the course of the fall, winter, and spring months. Um, some chamber music performances, some talks and lectures, and um, it's a it's a great place to come. Uh, many of the concerts are on Sunday afternoons, and there's 
nothing nicer than sitting in Studio E and looking across the expanse of the lawn and the snow and the great red oak tree and um, hearing some some wonderful performance. Tony, thank you so much for being here. We've been chatting with Tony Fogg from Tanglewood. You can get information on Tanglewood's current season at tanglewood.org. I hope it's a great season for everybody. Thank you, and thank you for your support. Thank you. On this wraps up another edition of Athenaeum Spotlight with Guy McLean. I'm Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles has been our chief engineer. We'll be back next Wednesday with another edition of On the Mark or Athenaeum Spotlight here. Thanks for joining us. Mm-hmm.